Well, welcome to this week's R3 study. We're continuing our series, Love Where You Are. We've been spending the last five weeks diving into this idea that we are to be the love of Christ wherever we are, wherever God has placed us. But in John 3.16, we read about the greatest love, that God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, he actually sent his son into the world. Love left heaven and came to earth to be one of us. Now, this last Sunday was Palm Sunday, and this weekend we talked about an interesting idea. This is almost the greatest love story. This story goes all the way back to the beginning, to Adam and Eve in the garden, walking and talking with God. At that time, nothing stood between God and man. In fact, the Bible says God would come down in the cool of the day and literally walk around with Adam and Eve. Everything was great, that is, until the fall. So God gives Adam and Eve some direction, and really all he did was he gave them a choice, and they chose poorly. Now, it wasn't that they didn't love God, they did. They just chose to believe Satan's lie that sin would not negatively affect their relationship with God. That's a lie Satan has been telling ever since. You see, sin broke our perfect relationship with God. Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden, and for the first time since creation, there was separation between God and man. The rest of history is a story of God trying to reconcile what has been broken. See, in the Old Testament, we read about uh, the sacrificial system where uh, we would sacrifice animals as a temporary substitute for our sins, and uh, God knew when he put this in place that it would fall woefully short. Fast forward to the New Testament, we begin to read about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who decide to try to take it upon themselves to live righteously enough. If the sacrifice wasn't enough, maybe we can be holy enough. And so they begin to, they took the Ten Commandments and begin to uh, implement them in a way that led to over 600 rules and regulations. And again, because mankind could never live up to that, it fell woefully short. All of this led to that moment in time, in the fullness of time, when God sent his son. You see, love came to town. Jesus appears on the scene. Love literally comes to town. People begin to follow him, and, and he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's doing miracles, and people begin to believe he could be the Messiah. The Passover celebration is about to happen. Let's look at the text in Matthew chapter 21. It says, As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. This scene is known as the triumphal entry. Now, not only does Jesus know exactly what's going on here, he's prepared for what it means. He understands that by riding in on the colt of a donkey, not only is this a symbol of peace and humility, but it's a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy that your king will come riding on a donkey. Let's keep reading. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, the phrase Hosanna in Aramaic literally means save now. And that's what they were begging him to do. They were looking for a political leader, a warrior king. That's what they were looking for, a deliverer in the Messiah. And so Jesus comes to town and they believe in him, almost. That's where we run into a problem. Almost isn't enough. He didn't do what they expected at all. Instead, he started talking about salvation, that in order to be great, you must be a servant. They found it easier to cheer when they thought Jesus was rising to their cause, but it was a completely different story when he didn't respond like they expected. By the way, how often are we guilty of this? I'll follow God as long as it looks like this. I'll serve God, but only this much. I'll give to God, but I won't give that. I'll become a believer. I'll fall into line as long as it looks a certain way. Let me ask you this question. Where do you almost love Jesus? Pilate isn't the only one who plays this game. Some of us are playing it right now. 
Some here have almost accepted Jesus. Some have almost surrendered their lives. Some have almost surrendered their time and their tithe and their talent. Some have almost decided to go all in. Almost. But almost just isn't enough. With Christ, you're either all in or you're all out. This weekend, we looked at two key reasons that we never get past almost with Jesus. First, we don't understand his purpose. There's something about experiencing trial and hardship that shifts our focus. And when it shifts our focus, it typically shifts our prayer life as well. We move from God, mold me, shape me, use me, to God, deliver me, save me, change my circumstances. We get so caught up in God changing our situation that we forget to worship God for who he really is. Second, we don't accept his terms. The sheer rejection of the cross illustrates a problem that existed then and still exists today. Salvation is free, but following is costly. The problem with those around the foot of the cross that day, and the problem with so many Christians today, is that we almost love Jesus. We love the idea of him dying for us, but we're not so crazy about the idea of living for him. And yet that was always what was expected. So how about you? What are you doing with Jesus? It all depends on what you do with his story. So as a group, I want you to wrestle with a couple of questions. First, where do you struggle with the reality of the cross? And second, where do you struggle with the cost of the cross? Wrestle with these two questions and then we'll jump in with Reflect. Have you ever had to count the cost for some unforeseen expenditures? Maybe it was a work project that you were forecasting out into the future to try and find out how much things were going to cost. Maybe it's a home repair and you're going to fix up the basement, but you didn't know that behind one of the sheetrocks uh, there was some mold to take care of. Maybe it was when you bought your car as a teenager and you had the price of the car all picked out, but you didn't have taxes and insurance and gas, and then you blew a tire and all of these unforeseen expenditures crash in. We talked a little bit on Sunday about this idea of counting the cost, the, the cost of following Jesus. And it's a common metaphor. It's woven all throughout scripture. As a matter of fact, it's something that we each carry within us, this idea of counting the cost of following Jesus. I think there's a small problem with that idea, though, and let me just tell you how it worked out for me. See, when I was young, about 16, I made the decision to follow Christ. I counted the cost. At that time in my life, I was willing to put everything on the line and to say, Jesus, I'm willing to follow you no matter what happens. Now that decision changed everything about my life from that day forward. Did I count the cost? Absolutely. And I was willing to pay it on that day. The problem was that I was 16. And at 16, I was able to make that statement with no reservations, but I couldn't know all of the things that were coming. I couldn't know all of the expenditures that would happen. I couldn't know the full cost of following Jesus at that moment. And I'd argue that neither could you. See, following Jesus ended up sending me to a college. And at that college, I was able to pursue uh, a career in ministry. I was able to pursue a degree in ministry. I met and fell in love with my wife, and we got married and had two kids. The cost of following Jesus was tremendous. I got to have a family and fall in love. The cost of following Jesus also led us to have a miscarriage and some of the deepest and darkest pain that we've experienced together as a couple. Following Jesus led me across the world to Thailand to serve for a while, to come face to face with human depravity and human lostness and to have to wrestle with soul wrestling questions about what it means to follow God in every area of our life. See, at 16, I'd made the commitment, I'd counted the cost to follow Jesus. I just didn't know all that that cost entailed. How could I? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can count the cost of following Jesus at any moment in time, but we perhaps fail to know or fail to notice that that cost changes over time. That Christ demands more of us, and as our life gets fuller, as we have more and more opportunities to serve Jesus, that cost changes. It isn't static, it moves. 
which leads me to one of the scriptures that Pastor Phil shared on Sunday. It's Luke 9, verse 23. Let's read it together. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. I want to draw your attention to that word daily. The scripture says, picking up your cross daily. I think we can also extrapolate out from that this idea of counting the cost daily. See, we can make a decision in time to follow Christ, to put it all on the line, to count the cost past, present, and future, but we simply can't know what's coming next. And so the Bible encourages us to make that decision daily, to count the cost of following Jesus today, now. In this current season, in this current moment, am I still willing to count the cost, to pick up my cross and to put Jesus first? Life changes, the situation changes, the budget changes. All of these factors contribute to that. And while a childlike faith of making a commitment to follow Jesus at one time is tremendous and extraordinary and good, it doesn't negate the fact that it's a daily decision to pick up our cross and to follow him. And so in this season, I wonder where you're at with that. Are you following Jesus today? As life has turned and as it's shifted and as things have come up that you could have no way anticipated, are you still prepared to count the cost of following Jesus? On Sunday, Pastor Phil talked about people who almost follow Jesus. And so maybe a way that we can sum up is this. People who don't count the cost almost follow Jesus. People who fail to reevaluate in light of increasing costs almost follow Jesus. People who count the cost daily follow Christ one day, one step at a time. So how about you? What's the cost of following Jesus right now in your life? And are you willing to pay that cost to keep in step with him one day at a time for the rest of your life? I hope you have a great discussion. I'll see you back here next week.